All right. Good afternoon. Thank you for being here today. Joining me today are Mayor Scott, Mayor Brandon Scott, State's Attorney Ivan Bates, Chief Deputy Matthew Silverman of U.S. Marshals, representatives from our Criminal Investigation Division, as well as Councilman Costello and Councilman Conway over City Council. We're here to announce the arrest of Jason Dean Billingsley for the September 25th murder of La Pava Lapeer and the September 19th arson and rape incident on Edmondson Avenue. Billingsley was taken into custody in Bowie at approximately 11 o'clock last night by our Warrant Apprehension, Apprehension Task Force, U.S. Marshals Capital Area Regional Fugitive Task Force, Maryland State Police, Baltimore County Police, Prince George's County Police, Howard County Police and ATF, as well as Bowie State University Police and D.C. Metro Police all worked together to take him into custody. I want to thank all our partners for their assistance in apprehending this violent criminal. Through the tireless efforts of the men and women of the Baltimore Police Department and our local, state, and federal partners, we are able to capture this violent criminal without incident or further loss of life. I know this arrest does not bring back Pavel Lapeer or take away the heels of the many victims of Mr. Billingsley. Um, but it, my hope is at least we can give a sense of closure to the city of Baltimore, the, the victims of all of his crimes and all their families. Investigators continually and actively review all open cases since his release in October of 2022 to determine any connections that exist. We're going to put this individual, this violent criminal offender, repeat offender, back in jail where he belongs. Now let's all work together to make sure that he stays there. What I can confirm in reference to this incident and the reference to the incident on September 29th, right now all the indications are that this was not a random act of violence. We have information to believe that the victims from Edmondson Avenue were targeted by the suspect, that the suspect knew the victims, and he went into that location for a uh, criminal reason. We know that the victim and suspect were known to each other. Additionally, we know that the victim, did, the suspect, did not break into the building as he worked at that location. Through witness testimony and surveillance, we were able to develop the identity of the suspect and a warrant was issued for him for Edmondson Avenue within hours. <clears throat> I can confirm that the warrant was a priority and we brought in our law enforcement partners from the U.S. Marshals as well as a flyer was distributed to every single officer in the Baltimore Police Departments. <clears throat> our detectives alongside our partners at the Marshals were monitoring and surveilling to, surveilling to apprehend the suspect. This includes tracking his phone, looking at financial transactions, looking at social media, surveilling known addresses, speaking to multiple witnesses, and listening to his previous jail calls. Additionally, there were several instances in which we were able to track a close proximity of his location. However, he was still able to elude. As a matter of fact, we had the press conference the other day to, um, about Ms. Lapierre's de death. We were delayed that press conference because we were within about 88 meters of capturing the suspect, but he was able to elude our capture. We knew early on that the risk that the risk was when we went public that the suspect would go underground, which is exactly what he did. As soon as the news uh, conference happened the other day, he basically left the location where he was at. Um, we did a search warrant at one location. He had just left because he saw the news conference. In reference to the homicide of Ms. Lapierre, we are still processing all evidence to determine exactly what occurred. We do know that there was no forced entry in the apartment building as this was a secured building. We don't know if there are any connections previously to Ms. LaPierre or Mr. Billingsley. This is what we will continue to investigate as well as the incident on Evans Avenue. I want to be very clear that in reference to both incidents and throughout these investigations, all information that was provided was based on preliminary details available at the time. Every BPD officer received notification of the warrant on September 20th and they were aggressively trying to capture the individual and to locate his whereabouts and take him into custody. Since then, he has been continued to be our number one priority until his capture last night. Our WATF task force, as well as the U.S. Marshals, started to track him on September 20th, and we tracked him all the way until we captured him yesterday.
I'm aware that the last few days have been unnerving for our citizens, and I sincerely hope we are able to find a little bit of peace today. I ask that we continue to respect the privacy and safety in the families of the victims and witnesses at this time. Our priorities will always be the safety of our residents and apprehending those individuals responsible for those crimes. At this time, I will now hand it over to Chief Deputy Matthew Silverman of U.S. Marshals. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, everybody, and good morning. My name is Matthew Silverman, and I have the distinct pleasure of serving you all as the Chief Deputy, United States Marshal for the District of Maryland. First and foremost, I would like to express my condolences to the victims affected by this tragic situation. All the families, our thoughts and prayers go out to each one of you and the citizens of Baltimore. With that said, I would like to express my sincere appreciation for the work done by all of our criminal investigators, detectives, and police officers who serve on our Capital Area Regional Fugitive Task Force. These dedicated professionals worked around the clock to locate this and apprehend this violent fugitive because of their tireless efforts of the Baltimore City Police Department, the Maryland State Police, the Prince George's County Police Department, and our other federal and state partners, we were able to secure this individual without any further incidents. This, this arrest truly speaks to the power of our public interests and safety partnerships with each one of you. I thank everybody for all the continued support, and uh, hopefully we don't have to be up here anytime soon to do another press conference. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you all for being here. Uh, thank you to all of our colleagues, uh, my elected colleagues, Councilman Costello, uh, Councilman Conway, of course, uh, the fabulous people that did this work from both the marshals, the BPD, our homicide detectives, because we gave you all our word that we would not stop until we brought this individual in and that we exhausted every resource uh, to make sure that we brought him in to keep our residents safe. It is very clear uh, that this individual uh, posed a substantial danger, that he had been non-compliant and was clearly vi violating the terms of his supervision after being released, and that alone uh, should be enough to make sure that we keep him off the streets. This morning, I want to commend the excellent work of not just the VPD, the marshals, all of our law enforcement partners who work together in apprehending this gentleman for uh, the murder of Pava and uh, the rape on Emerson Avenue, uh, because every single life in Baltimore matters. Pava's life matter. Those individuals who he impacted in other incidents matter. Those who we've done it to in the past, their lives matter. As you know, I had the pleasure of knowing Pava, and she was truly a light in our city and in this world. It's heartbreaking uh, that she is no longer here with us, especially at the hands of someone who, as I said the other day, should not have been on, on the streets in the first place. Uh, we will continue uh, to make sure that we are working with our state's attorney and our partners to make sure that he does not get that same fate again, that he does not get back out on the streets here in Baltimore with the opportunity to harm others. I had the opportunity to speak uh, with Pablo's family late last night, uh, giving them the news of this arrest, and then we're going to again ask that everyone continue to pour light and love into their family, and pour light and love into our community. I'm sending all of those who know Pablo. Our entire city heart aches with them, and while this arrest will not bring her back, I hope that it does begin the process of closure for her family, her friends, her community, and all of Baltimore. To our residents, uh, thank you for continuing to do that wrapping around. Thank you for every tip that was sent in, every single notice that we got, because we all have to work together to do this and make Baltimore a safer city. Just as uh, this city does any time we lose a federal Baltimorean. To BPD and our law enforcement partners, thank you for your dedication, your diligence, and your persistence in tracking this individual down before he could harm anyone else. I hope uh, this sends a message to everybody else who likes to uh, commit these kind of cowardly, horrendous acts to know that we will not tolerate it and we will pull you off of the streets of Baltimore. And with that, I will turn it over to our state's attorney. Good morning, and thank you, Mayor Scott. Again, this case will end up before my office. Therefore, I cannot discuss any of the facts 
as our Constitution says, everybody's innocent until proven guilty in a court of law. However, I want to begin where all of our focus should remain, and that is with the victims of both cases and their families. My thoughts and prayers can continue to be with them, even as we stand here to announce an arrest in this case. And my hope is that we have some measure of relief today, all the citizens of our area, knowing we just how hard everybody has worked to ensure that the suspect has been apprehended. I want to extend my sincere gratitude and appreciation to the Baltimore City Police Department, Baltimore County Police Department, U.S. Marshals, Prince George's County Police Department, Warrant Apprehensive Task Force, and everybody else within law enforcement that collaborated to make sure that this individual could be now in custody. I also want to applaud my own offices, Homicide Division and SVU prosecutors. They worked in collaboration with the Baltimore City Police Department around the clock. They had to ensure what we were going to do in putting this case together. Now, where do we go from here? I've decided that two of my most experienced prosecutors will have this case. They worked with this case from the very beginning. Every single lead, every single detail, they have been involved. They will have this case, and they will eventually present this case as all cases go in front of the grand jury. And if and when the grand jury gives us the indictments, my office will file life without the possibility of parole. Our hope and goal is if this individual is found guilty in a court of law, that this individual will never get out to see the light of day again and to ever hurt any of the citizens of our fine city ever again. At this time point, I will turn this back over to the commissioner. Thank you. We'll take questions. Alex Ashwell, Fox 45 News. This is a question for Acting Commissioner Worley and Mayor Brandon Scott. You said Billingsley was being tracked, yet he was still able to commit another violent, heinous act. How is that so? And at what point do you weigh the community safety? This was a violent rapist who was roaming the streets of Baltimore and the public had no idea. Could this knowledge have prevented Pava's death? I'm not going to speculate whether it could have prevented her death, but what I know we did is as soon as we realized that there was a public safety, we put we had the press conference. The first incident on Edmondson Avenue was not a random act. Had it been a random act, we would have put out a flyer right away saying that this individual was on the loose committing random acts. We know pretty much why he went into that house on Edmondson Avenue and why he committed those acts. He worked at that building. He was familiar with the victims. Um, I'm not going to say too much more because I don't want to talk bad about victims. Um, but he was there for a reason. Um, and it was at that point our detectives and everyone in the department decided that he was, we didn't think at that point that he was committing random acts because he had been, we knew he had been out since October 2022 and we had no incidents that he has been connected to. We're going to go back and look and see if we have anything that he could be connected to. But at that time, we did not believe that he was committing random acts. We think he committed a targeted act on the, the victims that he victimized that day. And, uh, my follow-up question, I mean, there are a lot of eyes on this press conference. People are angry. Your message to them, if they're questioning why they should trust the Baltimore Police Department with their safety. Um, the main reason is, if we made a mistake, I'd tell you we made a mistake, like I did in Brooklyn. I don't think we made a mistake in this case. I think our detectives made the same decision we make every single time based on the facts and circumstances that we have. And as soon as we realized he had committed an act that seemed to be random, um, that we still don't know connections there yet, we put the flyer out. And just as we thought, as soon as he saw the flyer, he tried to elude capture and turned off all devices we were able to track him on. Thank you. And, and just to add, Alexa, to that, I think we have to understand that 
uh, residents should trust the Baltimore Police Department in doing their work because they do that work each and every day. It was the Baltimore Police Department that did the work that led to the initial case that he was in, in prison for. And what the residents of Baltimore should be doing is questioning why he was let out and how that happened. And that's not on the police department. And they're the ones who are out here arresting folks for murder, taking record numbers of guns off the street, having a double-digit de deficit in homicides, reducing that each and every day along for side our law enforcement partners, they are doing that work. Uh, but we know that we're talking about a system uh, that we also have to deal with because they didn't decide to let uh, uh, this sociopath back out on the streets of Baltimore. Thank you. Phil Yakubuski from WBAL News Radio. This uh, question is for the commissioner. What were the circumstances surrounding his arrest uh, late last night? Uh, where in Bowie uh, did he admit to it at that point? Um, you said without incident, did he have a weapon? Can you describe exactly what happened? Yeah, I, we got information that we, we knew where he was at, um, or we knew where he was going. PG County SWAT set up, and when he showed his face, they took him into custody without incident. There was, I, I can't comment on whether what happened after we interviewed him or if we recovered a weapon. Um, Knowing what you know now, should you have put out a better photo of him earlier after the Edmondson Avenue incident? Hindsight's always 20-20. If I would have known that he was going to go and kill someone, we would have put the flyer out. But we had no indication that he was committing random acts. This was a targeted act that he went into that apartment that he worked in, a building that he worked in, that he had access to the apartment. He was, he was allowed in the apartment. Um, so there was no reason to believe that he was out committing random acts. Had we believed that, the flyer would have came out to everyone on September 20th as soon as we got the warrant. Uh, Justin Fenton, Baltimore Banner. Uh, is it accurate that you've received information that there may be another dead person in a vacant home, and is that valid? No, that's the first I'm hearing of that. Okay. Um, secondly, I, I truly understand the difficulty of putting out information when you're not sure if the person did it or if you don't want to alert the suspect. But jumping to the press conference on Tuesday, you were asked point blank if there was other crimes. You did not answer that question. The mayor did not answer that question. You did not talk about the Edmondson Avenue ish, uh, incident, even though there was a warrant out, even though he was now on notice that he was being looked for. Why was that incident, why did you refuse to acknowledge and discuss that incident? I, I think I answered that earlier because at that time we were tracking him. We no, were. That's not, that's, not, that's not what I'm asking. Once you put out a press conference saying you're looking for him for the murder in Mount Vernon, why didn't you acknowledge the incident on Edmondson Avenue where there was a warrant out for a week? because there, there was two victims from Edmondson Avenue that were still out. One was in the hospital, one was at their location. We had to get them protection if we were gonna put that information out and we had to send Ball Anne Arundel County and we had to protect those two victims because we didn't know what this guy was gonna do if he was gonna go back and try to apprehend them. Plus, once he saw the press conference for the, for the homicide, we didn't know where he was going to go. We knew several locations he could go, and we had those all under surveillance. Um, and they were actively tracking him while we were at this press conference. That's why it was that press conference. That's why it was delayed for 30 minutes. Elizabeth Worthington from WMAR2 News. I have the same question as Justin. What changed then between the press conference on Tuesday and yesterday when you did release the information that he was wanted in both cases? As soon as we realized that he had um, committed both, confirmed that he was the suspect in both cases, then we knew he was fleeing at that point, so we had to get it out as soon as possible. As soon as we realized he had done what we, what we considered at, at the time as a random act, then that changes everything from the first act, which was targeted. Once there's a random act, then we don't know what he's going to do. Um, and once we had the press conference, and say that he's out there, because we didn't know that he was going to watch the press conference. We didn't know that he would be watching it. Um, once that's out there, plus we have an investigation once we take him into custody to speak to him about the Edmondson Avenue case without giving up any details that we would know on that case. So um, those are all things that were taken into consideration as to why um, we didn't answer that. We already had him wanted for the murder. Um, Follow-up question is yep. for the mayor. I know you kind of touched on this a bit on Tuesday, but I think people are still really upset about the fact that he was let out of jail at all. Do you think something should change? Do you think that the violent offenders should not even be eligible for those good time credits that he got? I think that, and I'll say this again, I think that every single case is different. 
Uh, but when you go, and, and I know that you'll do this, and you go and look at uh, the facts of that original case, you will agree that he shouldn't have been out on the streets. Every case, every individual is different, right? And I think that that's what has to happen, that we have to continuously look at things as they are, but the facts as they are for this case for someone who committed rape, he shouldn't have been out on the streets. Thank you. Mike Halgren, WJZ. Uh, can you say, was Billingsley cooperative? Has he consented to any sort of interview by your detectives and provided you any more information about why he did what he did? Um, I can say he was cooperative when we took him into custody because he was surrounded by a SWAT team. So um, he did cooperate and turn himself in. We're not going to release anything about the interview with the detectives. And I don't know that if this would be for Mr. Bates or others. I mean, are you, are you looking back at how the case was you know, handled and any, you know, perhaps deal that was made back in 2015? And, and do you think that there should be some reform to these good time credits at all? You put me on the spot again with the law, huh? Um, a couple of things we did, yes. We immediately went back, we pulled the file. And pulling the file, what we definitely noticed was that a plea was given. And the plea was a little bit below guidelines. I'm not here to talk about it. It was a different administration. That prosecutor is no longer there. But there, with every single case, there are different issues that you have to look at. Are the witnesses and victims cooperative? What's the evidence? Things like that. So I'm not going to go back and say hindsight's 2020. But you also sit down and look at what's called DEM, a diminution credits within the Division of Correction. In 2016, the legislature passed a law that said if you do a sex offense, a rape, or a sexual assault on a someone 16 or younger, you are not eligible for diminution credits. Maybe the legislature could maybe look at what first-degree sex offense or first-degree rape. Are these individuals still going to be eligible for diminution credits? If that was the law then in 2013, when he was first arrested, then he would not have been eligible for parole. Thank you. Hi, I'm Cassidy Jensen from Baltimore Sun. Um, oh, hi. Thank you. A little short. Um, for the commissioner, um, can you say, was he armed when he was arrested? How was he able to, to be brought in without incident? Um, I think when he was surrounded by the SWAT team, he got the message that he might want to give up. Um, and Prince George's County SWAT team was waiting for him. When he showed his face, they took him into custody. Um, I don't know if he was armed. They, we processed it. I'm not, we won't release that because it's all part of the evidence. Um, sure. And then, um a question earlier about the protection for victims, and that was a reason why. Um, when, when were they sort of given protection, and, and why weren't they given protection before that press conference? Well, one, one was in the hospital. Um, one, we had no, two, we had no indication that he was going to go back after them. But once we would have put out that they were part of it, and he knew that we were part of it, he could possibly go back and try to harm them. And, finish what he didn't on that day in Edmondson Avenue. So we had to make sure because one of them doesn't live in the city and the other one was in the hospital. So we had to make sure that we were protecting them. This is also a question. Uh, it's Barry Sims, WBAL TV, uh, dealing with uh, the uh, gun. Uh, apparently there was a warrant out from Baltimore County about a uh, theft of a gun um, and trying to see if that's also connected to this case and what do you know about all of that? Um, we know that he did steal someone's gun. Um, that was another reason that indicated that we needed to put that flyer out as well. I think, I don't know if we got that before or after, um, but we knew that he had access to a gun and he made se several statements that he was going to be dangerous and maybe hard to take into custody, which ended up not being the case, but thankfully. Um, but yes, we do know about the gun. There was a warrant. He's charged with that case as well. You said he made several statements about the gun. Where were these statements made and when did he make them? I don't know why he made them. He's a psychopath. When did um, he make um, He made them when he stole the weapon from the individual he stole the weapon from. Hi, WYPR, Emily. Can you give us any details about the evidence that linked Billingsley to a LaPere camera footage, DNA, cell phone, anything? You mean you say you're certain? I can't tell you exactly, but I can tell you that um, our detectives happened, the same detective happened to be on the scene of both cases and was able to pick out the suspect pretty quick. Okay. Um, and just 
a follow-up. I'm, I'm slightly confused after the answer to WMAR's question. She had asked what, uh, you know, why you waited to announce the Edmondson Avenue and you said you wanted to be certain about the suspect. So I, I'm, but you said earlier that you knew at the time of the last press conference that he was involved in both cases. When exactly were you for sure, for sure that this was the person? Probably not long before that press conference. We had, we did the press conference um, once our detective confirmed, because all we had was the detective saying that it was the same person. We had to confirm through other means of evidence to tie him to that case with LaPierre before, Miss LaPierre, before we could tie him to Edmondson Avenue. We knew he did Edmondson. We just had to tie the two cases together. Um, but we didn't, re we didn't release Edmondson simply because I, I don't think it would have helped us at the time. Um, I think we did not want to kind of tip our hands that we knew that he did Edmondson because we still have to, in, we still have to interview him for Edmondson. Um, and he may just say he didn't do it. So um, we don't want to give him any indication of what we have. The murder warrant itself um, was going to cause him to flee. Thank you. Hi, Nicole Skanga, CBS News. Thank you so much for doing this. I realize it was a prior administration, but hoping someone here can offer clarity to the public. Why was this dangerous criminal on the streets in the first place? What were the terms of his release and eventual supervision? Yes, thank you. So basically in June 23rd, 2013, uh, he was alleged, he was charged with a crime. It took about 2015 before he actually went to court. When he pled guilty in court, he pled guilty to um, sex offense in the first degree. And then you have, in Maryland, what's called sentencing guidelines. His guidelines for that offense were about 15 years to 25 years. He received a sentence of 30 years, suspend all but 14 years, which meant that he would be incarcerated for 14 years. However, in the state of Maryland, you can earn what's called diminution credits. We get almost 30 days of good time for almost every day I mean, for every month that you're in, in custody and you're not messing up. So he had what's called diminution credits. Therefore, he didn't need to be paroled. He did a little less than two-thirds of his sentence, and that's what the law allows. So when you look at it, it was more or less the systematic, to me, failure in terms of what happened, because when you look at this, the plea bargain was a little bit below guidelines, but it was a different administration. I don't know all the issues within the particular case. You can maybe have a victim who doesn't want to testify. It's very difficult when you do sex offense cases because you may or may not have the DNA. There are a number of different issues. I wasn't a prosecutor, so we don't have that information. But what we do have is that there was the offer of 30 years to spend all but 14. We even know that the judge who handled the case was a little reluctant in terms of accepting that plea bargain. Um, hindsight, like they say, is always 2020. I think now that we see how diminution credits work and how an individual that, yes, had a prior conviction for, I believe, a robbery and assault uh, convictions as well, that, you know, at the end of the day, I think <clears throat> the prosecutor who handled the case <clears throat> would say, we had a dangerous individual off the streets for a few years. Yes, um, but we also now need to look at, in terms of the system, that allows for the diminution credits of an individual with his background as well as with those charges. So that's why I say the system. Ultimately, credit. it was a judge who authorized his release. Well, it was the state's attorney's office that made the offer, and the court accepted that offer. So it was everyone involved. Um, and can I just ask the commissioner just one quick follow-up, because you had mentioned that uh, all cases since his release are under review for possible connections to other incidents. Is there any evidence of other criminal activity that this suspect could be connected to? Not right now. If we, if we had had that, we would have put the flyer out as soon as um, we had the warrant for Edmondson Avenue. But there's no indication right now that he has done anything that we're aware of since October 22nd. That doesn't mean he hasn't done anything that's not reported. And if anybody is a victim of something he's done since October 22nd, um, please come forward because we need, we need to speak to you because we, we want to speak to all the victims of, of this individual because he's, he's, thankfully we got him into custody now. Hopefully we can put him away for a longer period of time the rest of his life.
Hello, thanks for doing this. Evan Lambert with News Nation. Uh, for the state's attorney and the mayor, uh, sorry, for the state's attorney and the mayor, going back to the good time credit, we know from the parole commission that they denied him parole twice before he was released. Should that be a red flag and should that be changed in the law as a warning that somebody who the parole commission is saying is not eligible for release then just gets out? Well, look, without a doubt, when you look at the law, they changed the law, I mean the legislature changed the law in 2016 that said if you do a sexual act, the first degree, to a individual 16 or younger, you are not eligible for demunition credits. I would ask and I would love to see that law looked at again in terms of all sexual acts whether in the first degree, whether it's rape or sexual assault. So to answer your question, I'm not a member of the legislature, but I do think that's something that we should all look at because it helps to keep our public a little more safe. Because if an individual with that background, and you also may look at the background, the prior repeat violent offender, uh, the diminution credits, they're gonna get them no matter what happens because that is the law. And so when you look at it, um, I think for us, we need to see what we can learn from this and understand how the diminution credits work and how it's letting some individuals that may not uh, be fully rehabilitated back on the streets maybe a little more quickly than they should be. And I'll just say it very simply, uh, the state's attorney has said it very eloquently, rapists shouldn't be let out early, period. Uh, when you rape someone, no matter if it's someone's daughter, son, their wife, like you should not get out early, period, for that kind of offense. And then one quick follow-up for the police chief. Uh, how is it possible if he was being surveilled and tracked so closely for six days that he wasn't able to be arrested in that time period? Because we, we never got close enough. 88 meters is the closest I believe we got, which is about 300 feet, which is about the size of a football field. Um, and that was while we were doing the, just before, that was why the delay was for the press conference, because we knew where he was at. And we were looking for him. He just disappeared and then, <clears throat> we weren't able to track him, and then as soon as the press conference happened, um, the devices we were tracking him on were disconnected, and he started using other means to communicate. Uh, Brian Todd from CNN for the, for the commissioner. Can you drill down a little bit about the sequence of events on Monday when the murder of Pavel Lepere occurred, how he got into the building, when, what happened right after that? Um, well, Monday is when we discovered Ms. LaPierre. Um, she was reported missing a few hours prior, and we ended up recovering her body in, um, at that address. It seems that she was probably murdered on Friday night, um, and it wasn't recovered until she wasn't recovered until they re re reported her missing on Sunday, I mean Monday. Can you give any more detail on Friday night? I mean, again, sequence, how it, how it occurred. Sir, I'm sorry, you weren't here the other day, but we're not going to do that. One, this is an open and active case, but also, again, uh, at the request of the family, we are not publicly sharing those details because the reality is, is that this young woman was murdered by this man. Uh, he will do that time. All of that will come out, but the family has asked that we not share those kind of details, and we're just going to ask you guys to respect that wish. Good morning, Mark Meredith with Fox News. I, I do want to follow up on Brian's question because I do think it's interesting. So, police now believe that Friday was the time of the actual incident. Is that correct, sir? Yes. Okay. And then between Friday and Monday, she wasn't reported until Monday morning to be missing, correct, sir? Yes. Okay. Second question. When you guys were able to apprehend him last night, was it his cell phone essentially that gave him away, or how were you able to determine uh, at the train station that's where he was? Um, I'm not going to release that because it would put people in jeopardy. Okay, and last question, oh, just this is my last question, for the, US, for the uh, state attorney, can you say what the conditions were of his release at the time? What his conditions were? Yes, he was supposed to make sure he complied and follow the laws of the great state of Maryland. He was also make sure he was supposed to be in compliant with being a sexual offender registry because the previous conviction forced him to be on the sexual offender registry. And he was also supposed to see his parole and or probation agent. Um, and so based on all of that, I'm sure he also had to stay away from the victims of a previous offense as well. And he was not allowed to be near any weapons or any handguns or anything, or also around any other felons that he knew of. So he was on probation? He was on parole and probation. Yes, sir, he was on both. Thank you. Appreciate it. 
And, and one thing I can tell you, and another reason why um, we held off a little bit on um, Edmondson was he was compliant with our sex offender registry. He was supposed to show up on Monday, um, and he never showed up. Show up, show up to where Monday? He was supposed to show up and register with our sex offender unit. To register for the first time? No, no. Oh. To, he has to do periodic checks, and he was compliant, um, and we knew he was scheduled to turn to check in with our sex offender registry unit on Monday, and he didn't do it. Uh, Julia Jester with NBC News. I have a quick follow-up. I know you don't want to release uh, details of the murder itself due to the family's privacy, but given that you said there was no sign of forced entry into the building, can you clarify where she was found, if, she, if they had broken into her residence, if, you know, since there was no sign of forced entry? No, we're, we're not. The, we're, to, the family has asked we not release any details, and we're going to honor their, their wishes. And then a question for... Uh, you and, and the mayor and whoever else wants to answer, obviously this is a horrific, tragic murder of Pava and someone who was beloved in the community. What do you say to the, the families of victims who their perpetrators haven't been apprehended and they haven't had quite the high profile press conferences as these of those that are, are still on the run and unsolved? Um, I can tell you our homicide detectives, it doesn't matter who the victim is, our homicide detectives investigate those cases like it was a family member. That's the unique thing about our homicide unit. That same day that Ms. Lapierre was killed, Mr. Braxton was killed. Um, 15 years old, shot in Gilmore, on Gilmore Street. They're investigating that case as, as diligently as they can. What happened in this case, the, the evidence just came quicker to them. It's not because of any other thing other than the fact that we got the evidence on this case quicker than we've got the evidence on Gilmore. We've got some evidence on Gilmore, and our guarantee, our homicide detectors are going to close that case too. And we'll have a press conference to tell you we closed that case at a 15-year-old. Um, but we also have two, over 200 other homicide victims in this city this year. So we work to try to solve every one of those cases. Our homicide detectors are one of the best in the country, and they work their butts off every single day to try to solve every murder. And I'll, and I'll just add that uh, the press conference on Monday, we talked about young Rashid just uh, as well. Now, we didn't get any questions about him, but we talked about him. And we've talked to his family. I've talked to his dad. And we, our detectives do not care who it is. They work every case the same way. I see how it impacts them. I see how it even impacts their mental state and have to make sure that they themselves are okay because it's not normal to do what they do every day and they do it better than any police department in the country uh, for my money. And we're gonna continue to make sure that every single family that goes through something like this gets that same treatment. But we also have to continue to push all of us in the community to make sure when we know who is shot and killed and murdered someone else's, else's family member that we let somebody know and treat it just like it was our own family. And I want to correct, I'm sorry, it was the 15-year-old is Rashid Maxwell, not Braxton, I apologize. 